Welcome to another video on financial economics. In this video, we are going to discuss fixed income securities. First, the money market. The money market refers to a market where money and other money-like or cash-like very liquid securities are bought and sold. Now try to remember what we talked about liquidity. Liquidity within financial economics means that the holder of any asset or security should be able to sell that security off without much trouble and without a depreciation in the value. So that means, let's say I have a money market security in my hand, which is worth $100. I should be able to go to the market and sell that one off at a price very close to $100. Now compare that with, let's say, a car. If you want to get rid of a car, and by that I mean sell a car or liquidate your car, the faster you want to liquidate, the more money you will lose out. The more desperate you are, the more money you will lose out. Because the market for cars is not liquid. Compared to that, the money market is a lot more liquid. Most of the securities traded in that market are bought and sold very close to the quoted value you see on the ticker tape on CNBC or Bloomberg. Now what differentiates the money market from the capital market or other forms of market is the maturity level. All the securities there, by definition, are shorter term. So it's one year or less. One year tops. So any security that is traded within the money market is called the money market instrument. Key examples of this would be treasury bills, government securities, in the case of Malaysia they are called MGS, Malaysian government securities, commercial papers issued by corporate houses, certificates of deposit or CDs, call money, repurchase offer agreement or repo, etc. These securities have several characteristics. They're all short term, as we know, one year or less. They're all very liquid, carry low amount of risk. That means default risk is very low and large denominations. That means this is the big boys club. That means that most of the securities are very large valued. For example, a commercial paper issued by Boeing Company, let's say. The minimum amount an investor can buy would be probably $500,000 or a million, something along that line, and not accessible to the ordinary investors. So now let's take a look at one of the most common money market securities and one of the most accessible by retail investors, T-bill or treasury bills. These bills are small denominations. Taking the US for an example, as low as $100 can buy one piece of T-bill. And these T-bills are exempted from taxation. And this is a distinguishing feature of this instrument. And you should also keep in mind that T-bills are usually in a zero coupon format. A zero coupon means that these are issued at a discount. So let's say there's a T-bill that you want to buy. The par value or the face value is $100. But it is being offered on the market for $95. So you pay $95 and upon maturity of let's say two years, you receive the face value back. So your return would be $5. And that is your yield. That is your profit. That is your return. And this discounting method is called the bank discount method. Okay, now for CDs or certificates of deposit, it is kind of a fixed deposit with a commercial bank. And these are usually insured by a third party, which is normally controlled by the government for a particular sum. In the US, the FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, insures it for a quarter of a million dollars. Similarly, in Malaysia, PIDM does the same. As for commercial papers, these two are shorter terms. These are issued by corporate houses usually, and also typically in large denominations. I previously used the Boeing example before, and these are very popular among manufacturing industry firms to use for working capital. But again, due to a large denomination, Smaller retail investors are not usually big buyers of this. Large-scale institutions are bigger customers, are bigger users of this instrument. Now we go on to Euro dollars. 
This term, your dollar, is quite confusing. And I'm saying this in the beginning because this explanation requires you to pay some serious attention. Your dollar is a very outdated term. Initially, when financial markets started becoming popular and active, there were mostly two players, the United States or North America, US and Canada, in one hand, and Europe, mostly based in London, Frankfurt, Zurich, and these cities. So back in those days, anybody who opened the bank account to make a fixed deposit, a time deposit, or a CD could do it in two places, North America or Europe. So if you're depositing dollar in a US account, that's just a normal domestic account. But if you're depositing US dollars in a dollar denominated account in Europe, that is a dollar which lives in Europe. As such, that is called a euro dollar. Now it's been many, many decades since then. The financial markets have evolved. Asia has emerged as a superpower. You have financial centers in Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai. So if somebody opens a bank account in any of these financial centers with any bank, in fact, you could even do that if you go to HSBC and open a bank account denominated in USD, you would be able to call your deposits euro dollars because the term essentially means any dollar based account, deposit account outside the US. It can be Asia, can be Australia, can even be Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, the practice has stuck and textbooks continue to follow this old outdated name. But because everybody in the industry uses this term, you have no choice but to try and remember this. Okay, next we go on to repo. Repo, R-E-P-O, stands for Repurchase Offer Agreement. It is a short-term loan which is collateralized or backed up by a government almost riskless security. Probably know by now that government securities are considered riskless because the government never defaults. So usually what happens is, let's say a commercial bank has a liquidity shortfall. They need to pay somebody money today. They have the money, but they don't have the cash. So what they can do is they can go to another commercial bank who is a dealer and get some cash from them on an overnight basis. Now in return for this cash, they will be putting in as collateral some government securities. But the promise is that tomorrow morning, they will pay it back. And when they pay their cash back, they will also receive the government securities that they pledged as a collateral to their counterparty. This is a very common way for overcoming short-term liquidity shortfalls. So in our example, the bank which needed the money engaged in a repo. The other person or other institution that they engaged with, for them, that is a reverse repo. As such, a reverse repo is the exact mirror image of a regular repo. If this sounds confusing to you, do not worry. It's just like a trade. When you go to the store and buy an apple, one apple is transacted. You're buying one apple and the shopkeeper is selling that apple, but it's the same apple, just that the transaction is recorded as a purchase for you and a sale for the shopkeeper. Similarly, in this case, the institution which is trying to get the liquidity is engaging in repo and the liquidity provider is engaging in reverse repo. Now we move on to the capital market, the longer term cousin of the money market. So we know that it's going to be longer term, so one year and above than that. This is also a liquid market and also a low risk market, but not as low as the money market. In money market instruments, you're essentially getting instruments which are very close to cash, almost immediately convertible into cash. But in the capital market, it takes a tiny little bit longer than that. Again, one of the most common and obvious examples would be treasury notes and bonds. Now remember, we started off with T bills, treasury bills. Anything to do with treasury has to do with the government. So when the treasury issues very short-term securities, they're called bills. Treasury bills, T-bills. Longer terms, 
The longer term ones, on the other hand, are called notes and bonds. Notes have a maturity of up to one decade and bonds can go on to up to 30 years. Can even be longer than that. Depends on the country. Now the par value here is a thousand dollars. So now it's more expensive. So less accessible to the smaller retail investors. Also in the T-bills we had zero coupon. Now we have semi-annual coupon payments. That means every six months coupon payment would be paid out. So this ensures a steady stream of cash flow for the bond or the note holder. And the quotations here are as a percentage of the par value or the face value. So if the quotation is at 4%, that means that coupon payment would be 4% of $1,000. That comes to $40. And that $40 would be paid to you twice a year. $20 in the first six months at the end of June and again at the end of December, assuming that you bought this in the beginning of January. In addition to these, there are other interesting bonds as well issued by the Treasury. One of them is TIPS. The T stands for Treasury. IPS is inflation protected. So what do we mean by inflation protected? The coupon payment rate here is usually linked to an inflation index. It might be inflation plus 1%. That means when it's time to pay for the coupon payments, if the inflation is 2.5% in the economy, you will be paid 2.5% plus 1% premium. So your coupon payment would be $35. 3.5% times $1,000 equals $35. Moving out of the U.S., there are some international bonds that we need to familiarize ourselves with. One of them is euro bonds. Again, pay close attention. This is kind of similar to euro dollars, but there's a catch. This is any bond that is denominated in any currency other than the home currency. Does that confuse you? Okay, I'll provide an example to clear that out. Let's say you're a Singaporean and you want to issue a bond. What is the currency of Singapore? It's SGD, Singaporean dollar. So you would expect them to issue that bond denominated in their home currency of Singaporean dollar. But if they decide that they want to issue this bond denominated in Indonesian rupiah, that then becomes a euro bond. Similarly, if the government of Indonesia tomorrow decides they want to issue a new bond denominated in Japanese yen, that too would be a euro bond. Because they're not issuing in rupiah, they're issuing in any currency other than rupiah. Another interesting bond is the Yankee bond. You might be familiar with the term Yankee. As the name suggests, it is related to the U.S. So, it's a dollar-denominated bond, which is sold in the U.S., but by a non-American issuer. That's the key. The issuer of that bond has to come from somewhere else. So let's say a Chinese corporation decides to finance their operations by floating a new bond in New York denominated in USD. That would then be a Yankee bond. So most of the discussion so far has been at a global or a state level. Now we move on to a smaller scale of local government, municipal bonds. You already know what municipality means. So a municipal bond is a bond that is issued by local state level governments and oftentimes this is exempted not only from the federal taxation but also at the local state level it depends on the bond usually in the u.s or other developed countries municipalities issue these bonds to finance a particular project let's say a toll road or a bridge or to roll out fiber internet connections so the municipalities the principals, the issuers of these bonds, generally have two ways of financing the bond payments. Because when they issue the bond, investors give them the money and they have to pay the money back to the bond buyers or the investors. So how do they do that? Two ways. One, they're still the government, so they have the taxation power. They're not the federal government, so they cannot print money, but they can still tax their own residents so the chances are very low that they would default on their promise of payments. 
So this is a kind of an implicit soft guarantee. But usually, in practice, what happens is the bonds are paid back using the projects that they finance. Let's say the tolls collected from the roads, the internet connection subscriptions they sell, etc. These bonds are also considered low-risk bonds, but not as low-risk as government-issued bonds. And by that, I mean the federal government-issued bonds, because they can literally print money, technically. Now on to corporate bonds. As the name is pretty self-explanatory, it is issued by large private corporations, whereby they extract money from the general public and usually also pay them semi-annual coupons. These coupon rates or coupon interest payments follow the same pattern as I discussed earlier. Because these are corporations, private entities, and they do not have the power of taxation, they do not have the power of printing money, they have a higher risk of defaulting. We are right now going through the COVID-19 crisis, the pandemic. Just look around yourself and see how many companies are going bust. A lot of these companies also issued bonds. Now, even two and a half months ago, things were just fine. And suddenly, they're in a cash crisis. There is no business to be conducted at all. They don't have a revenue. They don't have a cash flow. So how are they going to finance their bond payments? There is a very high risk of default. This is a live ongoing example of the higher default probability or higher risk of corporate bonds. Some of these bonds have some extra clauses or options attached to them. Some of these options are called embedded options. One such example is a callable bond. Callable means that the bond issuer is able to call the bond back. What is calling the bond back? Let's say they have a change of mind. After issuing the bond, they discover that the market interest rate has gone down. They issued the bond at, say, 6% coupon interest. So they have to pay their investors 6% every year. But for some reason, the market interest rate went down to 3%. So now they realize they can issue a new bond from the market at 3% and use that money to finance the same project. Why should they be stuck with a higher payment? So if they issued a callable bond or a bond with a call option available, they can choose to close out that bond payment. They can choose to retire that old bond. But of course, this does not come free. They also have to compensate the bond investors in some form. Therefore, if they choose to call the bond back, they have to pay a certain price. And that is called the call price. Another innovation related to corporate bonds is convertible bonds. Before, with callable bonds, we talked about the option of the bond issuing company to call back that bond. But with the convertible, the option is with the bond holder, the investor. They can choose not to hold that bond anymore and convert that bond into a share of the company. So the conversion goes from the bond to the stock. So that concludes a brief overview of the most important fixed income securities. Remember, the money market is shorter term, up to one year, and the capital market is longer term. T-bills or treasury bills are issued by the government up to one year. Treasury notes up to 10 years. And treasury bonds up to 30 years or possibly even more depending on the country. In the next video, we're going to talk about the equity market.